Hi, it's Steve Hargadon, and welcome to Steve Wheeler keynote, and welcome to Steve. How are you? I'm very well, thank you, Steve. How are you doing? Thanks so much for being here. This is the we're closing in on close to the end of our final day of this conference. We actually had three nights of pre-conference keynotes, and then a full set of sessions today. Steve, can't imagine a better speaker or topic for the Learning Revolution Conference, the inaugural conference. Really appreciate your being here. Thanks to Classflow for supporting this event and next week's Reinventing the Classroom event. And thanks to Blackboard Collaborate for this terrific platform. This is a chance for those of you who are watching live to indicate where you're participating from. Look to the left of the map. You're looking for the star icon. You're going to click on it twice and then click on the map, and then put your location, time, temperature in the chat if you would. I'm in North Carolina, and it's 5 p.m. We've had somewhat consistent attendance from India, Australia, and New Zealand. But I think uh, right now is probably a probably hard time for that, although probably Australia and New Zealand could join in Friday morning. OK, we're going to move forward, but feel free to keep putting notes in the chat there. And Steve, I'll turn the time over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, hello, everyone. It's uh, it's good to be here, there, and everywhere. Um, it's one of these sessions where um, hopefully people from all around the world will join in and um, take part in this. I I'd like, obviously, for you to um, think about what we're talking about today with, with students driving change, and then maybe um, come in at the end, because there'll be plenty of time for you to participate as well, I hope, and uh, just ask questions, or maybe even type in questions in the text box below, and. Um, and uh, we'll try and deal with the questions, or even Twitter. I've got a Twitter stream going live at the moment. There's one in front of me. Uh, so um, just, just um, send into my name, which is uh, the Twitter name is at Tim Buckteeth, and uh, I'll pick it up, hopefully. And uh, hopefully we'll have some dialogue as we, as we go along. I um, hope you're doing fine, everyone. Um, I've just spent four hours uh, driving back um, across the UK to be here in my, in my little office here in my house. Um, and it's uh, just gone past 10 p.m. The sun went down about an hour ago after I went out and bought the dog. And uh, it's quite pleasant outside, nice clear skies. Um, no rain now, but a little bit chilly. So that's, that's the weather report from, from here in Plymouth in the United Kingdom. Um, now, we're living in an, an incredible time, I think. We're living in a really privileged time. We're living in a time as educators when we are, we are using technology and we are using tools which those who preceded us never even dreamt of, 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 of using, never even dreamt that these things could exist, except maybe in science fiction. We're dealing with some incredible tools and some incredible opportunities here. And the students who I deal with, and I know the students that you deal with as well, are actually bringing a, a lot of these technologies actually into the classroom, into the, uh, the lecture room with them. And I thought it would be great today um, once I've you know, got this slot to actually speak to you, to actually talk about what students are doing with, with technology today and how they're using them. And I've got several student voices. In other words, um, people who are in my classes who have uh, agreed to sit and be interviewed by me. And I hope to show those videos to you. And, and Steve, with his um, mag magical touch with technology, is hopefully going to play those at the right points during this presentation to show you what my students are doing and how they're actually um, bringing in these tools and, and, and actually changing the way they learn. Uh, and I, and that's, I, I'm really excited about this, as you can see. And, and um, I, I want to actually start by 
before before we, we, we go into those videos, by talking to you a little bit about the nature of knowledge and the nature of transformation, because I think that's where we need to be headed. That's where we need to situate ourselves as, le as, as learners and as teachers. And this first slide here, this second slide here, I think this says it all. This is the problem that we face. And I talk about this a lot, and the problem never goes away because we talk about the future and we talk about something that's imaginary. We cannot predict the future. We cannot um, understand sometimes where we're going. All we know is when we get there, it's different to what we expected. And a lot of the, the jobs and the work that will exist in maybe two or three years' time when the students who are arriving now will go out into the world in, in higher education, uh, those jobs don't exist yet. So I think the biggest question is how are we going to prepare students for a world that doesn't exist yet? How are we going to prepare our learners for um, you know, a, a, a world of work which we can actually clearly describe as David Warlock says it? I'm going to turn my video off. Um, hopefully that will maximize my, my um, broadband in, in where I'm working here at the moment. So hopefully you'll still be able to hear me. And um, the next slide which I'm going to show you is actually um, quite an, an, an interesting statement. Albert Einstein, one of the cleverest people in the world, um, apart from my wife, of course, she, she's clever, and um, I have to say that because she's pretty standing behind me at the moment. Um, <laughs> I, she, he says, I never teach my students, I only provide the conditions in which they can learn. Um, I, think, I think that's um, a, a really important thing for us all to consider. Do we actually teach or do we just facilitate learning? Do we actually instruct or do we act as co-learners? And I think we have to countenance that. We have to start examining our roles as educators now. And I use the word educator rather than teacher now from now on because, um, I mean, teachers teach but educators reach and that's the difference. Educators go beyond just teaching. So if we're going to be educators for the, for the 21st century, what we're going to have to do is reappraise our approach to education. Um, education means drawing out from within. It means it, it's from the, the Latin word educere, which means to draw out from within. And if we're going to draw our learners out from within and actually allow them to achieve their full potential, then we've got to do what Einstein suggests and, and create conditions in which they can be creative, in which they can be critical, in which they can be reflective, in which they can work together in, in um, collaboration and co cooperation and, and where they can you know, forge new pathways which they own and which, which belong to them, desired paths which they create themselves. If we can do that, I think we are well on our way to preparing young people for a world of work that we can't actually clearly describe yet. And there's a wonderful story about Einstein, which I've told before, and maybe some of you have heard it, but I'm going to tell it again. It's probably not true, but I'm going to tell it anyway, because it really illustrates a great point about learning. And um, what, what Einstein apparently did was he went across to America, where a lot of you are now, uh, very early on in his career, just after he published his um, theory of relativity, and he wasn't very well known at the time, although his theory was, and he was um, asked to come across to uh, the United States to tour the universities and to give a, a speech about his special theory of relativity. And they assigned him a driver, a chauffeur, who had the cap and the, the coat, you know, the, the kind of the traditional driver. And the driver would follow him around, um, you know, actually drive him around and then follow him into the hall and then sit in the back with his cap and his coat on and listen to Einstein giving the same speech every night. And after about a dozen of these, um, Einstein was being driven to his next venue and the chauffeur said to him, you know, Professor Einstein, I, I could probably, I've heard your speech so often, I could probably give it myself. And Einstein said, well, I could do with the time off, so why don't you do so? We'll swap clothes and I'll sit at the back and you get up and give my speech. And so after a bit of thinking about it, the chauffeur agreed. So the chauffeur got into Einstein's seat and Einstein got into the chauffeur's uh, suit and Einstein sat in the back of the hall and the chauffeur got up and gave a world perfect rendition of the theory of relativity after which there was rapturous applause. Everyone stood on, the, on their feet and, and applauded him. And all these eminent professors were in the, in, in, in the front row. And at the end of it, um, the driver realized he was in trouble because the chair of the conference said, are there any questions? And of course, at that point, uh, the professor in the front row stood up and asked a question, and the chauffeur didn't understand the word of it, went right over his head. But quick as a flash, he said, thank you for your uh, question, professor, but I'm afraid it's so simple that even my chauffeur at the back could answer it. 
and that at that point you're supposed to laugh. I hope you did. <laughs> but the thing is, um, whether it's true or not, whether it's funny or not, what we're doing here is we're dealing with two types of knowledge. We're dealing with very, very surface knowledge, knowledge that is probably learned by rote, knowledge that doesn't really sink in much rather than, than our um, than our kind of um, uh, surface memory. But then we're also dealing with a deeper type of knowledge, which the chauffeur had, which I don't know what you would call it. You maybe, maybe, maybe you'd call it street wiseness. Maybe you'd call it um, uh, wisdom. Maybe you'd call it something else. But essentially, um, it's learning to think on your feet. It's about problem solving. And if you look at Martin and Salio's model here, which came out around, around about 1972, I think it was, they talked about three types of learning. They talked about surface learning and, and then deep learning. But then they also talked about strategic learning, where students could shift in between, um, depending on the context, depending on what problems they were dealing with. So surface learning, for instance, would come into play when um, students wanted to cram for a, for a final exam that they had to sit, maybe in a week's time. So they'd sit there and, and, and grab a whole load of content and, and just play through it and try to remember as much as they could to, to kind of regurgitate later on. That's fine for, for that kind of problem. When it comes to deeper problems, though, where you have to think strategically and where you have to think on your feet, when you have to be creative, then it's the deeper type of learning that we, we, need, to, um, we need to promote. And both of these, all three of these types of learning, I think, are valid, um, and, and they come out in different ways in, in the kind of, um, in the context of, of what the students find themselves in. And I, I think we have to be flexible as educators today. Now, if I show you this next slide here, this, this actually kind of encapsulates what I've said. Knowledge is kind of declarative. It's, it's about facts. It's about knowing that. We need a certain amount of that. That's our baseline knowledge. Then wisdom, or whatever you want to call it, the procedural, the skills, the uh, psychomotor domain, as, um, as Bloom and his colleagues would call it. Um, that's more about application. That's more about being able to apply that, that knowledge in, in new and maybe different ways, depending on how we encounter problems and what we encounter. And finally, the really, really deep knowledge, the kind of transformational knowledge, is really about criticality. It's about analyzing, evaluating, synthesizing. It's a higher level of, of, of Bloom's domains, if you like, of cognitive um, levels. It's about knowing why. So if you want to put that into some kind of context, if you can imagine this um, processing model here, the deeper you get, the deeper you engage with, with learning, um, the more it's going to transform your experience, the more it's going to transform your learners so that when they come out into a world which we can't describe, you know, when they, when they encounter new and unusual problems, they usually have some kind of mindset that allows them to tackle those problems. That's where I think we need to be heading as educators. We need to be instilling these kind of skills, these kind of competencies and maybe even, I'll talk about literacies later on, these literacies, we, we need to instill these within students, allow them to develop and practice them so they gain confidence and confidence and, and then um, they, they transform their experience and, and ultimately they'll be able to go into a world of work which we can't clearly describe and be able to find really uh, meaningful employment and, and hit the ground running. Um, so in, in a summary, if, we, if, you, if you think about tomatoes, if, if um, a tomato is a, is, is a fruit, that's knowledge. We know that a tomato is a fruit, that's a fact. But wisdom is when you decide that you're not going to put it into a fruit salad. But transformation is actually knowing why you don't put it in a fruit salad. Maybe some people do put a, a, a tomato or a tomato <laughs> into a fruit salad, um, they, but most people don't. And, and But none of us can really tell you why that happens, because it's a fruit. So. There, there are kind of some imponderables that we need to kind of think about. There, there are kind of discursive elements and iterative elements that we need to introduce, I think, into learning to, to, um, to, to really get students to, to gain a purchase on the learning and, and to transform their experience in that learning. So there's a bit of an open, opening kind of um, gambit on the nature of knowledge. And um, I was talking today at, at um, the University of Warwick um, and I know Teresa, who's in the audience here, was there with me today. So I'm um, not sorry, Sue. Not, and I, don't, I don't know if Teresa's there as well, but Sue is actually there. And and um, I, I showed a slide today, which I'm going to update. I can't actually show, show you a new slide, but I can actually tell you um, that if you switch the internet off for one minute, you would miss an incredible amount of stuff 
an incredible amount of content is being created there. Students are creating as much content, content as they're consuming. They're probably remixing and repurposing as much content as, as they're consuming. And Google alone, in one minute, processes 4 million, that's 4 million search inquiries. YouTube is seeing 72 hours of video being uploaded every minute. Facebook, 2.5 million or more items shared every minute. WhatsApp is 350,000 photos every minute being shared. Instagram, 200,000 images every minute. Skype, 23,000 hours of conversations every minute. There are 14 million Wikipedia articles in over 45 different languages. Pandora, 61,000 hours of music listened to every minute. And only one, only one paper-based article being published somewhere in the world every minute. That is a staggering set of statistics, I hope you agree. It's incredible to think that all that is going on on the internet every minute. The content is incredible. And yet, um, the trends also show us that we're going very much digital, that paper is not on the way out, but it's, it's becoming very much um, a peripheral activity now for content development and delivery. So this is, this is why I'm saying we have incredible opportunities as educators now. We have an incredible um, range of things that we can do and try and, and experience now as teachers and as learners. Um, so if you think about this model here, which comes from Corrales, it's, um, it's actually a kind of a, a, a replay of, of um, Leyden Wenger's um, communities of practice, I would, I would suggest to you. Um, if you look at the kind of the outer levels here, the outer orbits, a lot of students start off by coming in gradually and being drawn in, into the centre where they become core members eventually. Um, but a lot of them remain on the edge. They, they, they're peripheral participants maybe, or they're lurkers as we would call them. And um, really to actually draw them in, the transformational um, process needs to happen. And uh, Jack Merozov really talks about this. He talks about deep structural shifts. Uh, he talks about um, shifts in, in, in our thoughts, our feelings, and our actions. I suppose if you want to encapsulate it, it's, it's psychological changes, uh, changes in self-concept. It's, it's convictional changes, changes in maybe people's belief systems. That's a really difficult one to achieve um, because people believe what they want to believe, and sometimes those beliefs are very deeply cultural or religious or... or um, and some they um, instilled it into them from their, from their family traditions and so on. And, and um, the final change is behavioural change. It changes maybe in the way they approach things. And, and all of these kind of changes are achievable, but um, it, it's a kind of... Um, there, there is an event horizon, as Kevin Burden calls it. The, the, the idea that um, there's a point where you reach that centre, where you transform something in your life, and you never ever want to go back to where you were before. You're going forward from now on. You're never going back to it again. And uh, I see this happening with some of my students. And when you listen to the videos in a minute, you'll see you'll see what I mean by this: the way that they've um, they've transformed their ideas because of their engagement with social media and their engagement with knowledge through through those tools. Um, so traditionally, in, in higher education, at least we've always conceived of it like this, right from medieval times. Um, the whole idea of, of the lect lecturer is about lecturing, it's about um, instructing, it's about standing at the front, it's about didactic, it's about instructionalism. And um, even now, a lot of my students in my large groups are like this, but I, I have to say that the transformation that's happened so far is this, and you'll see this happening a lot now, won't you? I'll show you, um, you'll recognize this. Okay, this is an Apple-sponsored classroom, but the point is that each of these students, although they're still sat in rows, some people would say they're sat in tiers, and that has a double meaning, but they're sat in rows, but they are now actually, each of them, gaining a personal window on the world. So what you see happening now with my students in particular is that they are encouraged to Google what I've said, to search elsewhere for alternative perspectives and maybe argue against what, um, what, what, what may be being said in the classroom so that they can gain a critical perspective. 
and uh, they're, they're also entitled to go up and, and search to see whether what I'm, I'm checking is correct or not. Maybe sometimes I might throw a lie in de deliberately to actually try and um, catch them out to see if they're actually listening or to see if they know the difference between supposition maybe and, and uh, reality or, or, um, or truth and the lie, whatever truth is. Um, so a lot of this is happening now. Um, I see this happening in conferences as well. I was, I was um, sat at the back of a, of a very large conference not so long back, about a, a couple of years ago, and the speaker at the front, who was the keynote, finished speaking. And then the chair said, are there any, co are there, are there any conference delegates who want to ask a, a question? And a guy at the front stood up, and he mentioned his name and where he was from, the institute he belonged to. And even before he'd started asking his question, the two guys sat in front of me, both Googled him to find out who he was, see where he came from. And I thought, you know, nobody is anonymous on the internet anymore. It's incredible, isn't it? Nobody can hide. If you've got a, a footprint now on the internet, someone can find you, and they'll search for you and find you, whether it's on Facebook or Google or wherever. Um, so students now have the ability and the propensity and the desire to, to, to check things out for themselves. So they are becoming more proactive, I think, in, in learning, even in environments where they're being spoken at rather than engaging face-to-face um, you know, -face in, in a kind of, a, a, kind of um, a conversation, if you like. So things are changing because of these tools that they're bringing into the classroom with them. And uh, I often show this picture to actually illustrate a, a really important point, that it's not about generations. It's not about age groups. Um, whatever Prensky has said, Mark Prensky, about digital natives and immigrants, um, that's in the past, and, and I think he has um, admitted that it's an erroneous assumption there that older people are not as a, you know, have, don't have as much affinity to technology as younger people, and younger people know all about it. Um, it you know, it's, a, it's a bit of a, a fallacy to, to, to think that there are natives out there who, who, who speak fluent technology just because they're young, just because of the way that, you know, the time they were born. Um, it's really all about context. And I often, I often uh, mention Dave White and, and Alison Lacona here, who came up with an alternative theory that was a lot better, a lot more ap appropriate, because it was context-based. And it was the, uh, the idea of digital residents and visitors. Visitors are those who casually use a tool, and residents are those who habituate into use of it and they regularly use it and they find out all about it. Now, for me, I, I'm a bit of a, a Twitter resident. You know, I, I know how to use Twitter um, quite well. I know how to use it to promote ideas and to converse with people and to share content and so on. But I'm a bit of a, a Facebook um, novice, so therefore I'm, I'm only a, a visitor. So you can see that you can become a, a visitor and a resident at the same time, depending on the context of the tools you use. And I like that idea because I think it's much more appropriate. But um, you can imagine um, uh, you know, many generations being on the same platform together. So my father, who's 86, um, and my daughter, who is 21 now, they're both on Facebook together. That's two, two generations apart. That's three generations, if you like. And um, my father engages with people on, on Facebook, but sometimes he doesn't always get it right. So the other day, um, he, he lolled for the first time. And, uh, but he lolled inappropriately, and my daughter picked him up on it, because he, he had to break some sad news. He had to break the news that his sister had died, and um, at the end of it, he put LOL. And of course, she was really upset by this, and she said, Granddad, you can't say that. He said, why not? It means lots of love. And that was what he thought it meant, but what she thinks it means is laughing out loud. So there's a differential, there's a kind of um, a difference between the way some people use te you know, technology to express themselves. So I think we've got to be very careful that we make all these assumptions, um, that we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. There are differences in the way people use technology. It's not about age necessarily, though. It's about understanding, it's about context, it's about how you uh, use the technology. And at this point, um, I'd like to ask uh, Steve if he'd show the video that's related to this, which... Um, I hope you watch all the way through and, and then get the point. You need to see it all the way through. Is that okay, Absolutely. Steve? Absolutely. And I have these in the order that um, Amy pulled them out of your presentation. So for some reason, this isn't the correct one. Let me know, but I think it's correct. 
It's, it's the, uh, the last one that I sent you. Oh, this one, the last uh, one is? Okay. Yeah, the last one, the last one which I sent you on, on its own as a single email. Is that the one in the three? Yeah. And uh, this video, just to give you an introduction on it, I think it was created by Pearson. And if you've seen it before, um, you'll know the one I mean. It's called The Future of Publishing. And uh, it really kind of challenges our perceptions about what young people think. And I hope that you're able to, to see it. Here we are. That's the correct one. Thank you. It's the World Wide Web, isn't it? <laughs> Go make yourself a cup of tea, everyone. No, don't, don't. <laughs> Anyone got any funny stories? Tell you what, if it's not going to play, then um, maybe um, you can um, click on the link yourself and watch it later on. I think it's going to be um, quite a surprise to you if you haven't actually seen it before. If you have seen it before, I think it reinforces the idea that it's really all about perception. It is playing, is it, Steve? Excellent. I'll shut up then. <laughs> Okay, so I think that uh, played well for me. If you didn't, if it didn't play well for someone, I will put the link in the chat again. But I, at least on my end, I was able to see it just fine. Thanks, Steve. I'll be interested in what your views are on that afterwards. I think it is a little bit of a surprise, isn't it, when it starts to reverse? And um, I think the, the, the main message here is that yes, it's all about perception. How do we perceive our learners? Do we perceive them as, as kind of sneaking off to you know, kind of uh, to, to look at Facebook when, when, we're, when they're supposed to be concentrating on um, lecture, lecture or whatever. Um, you know, and, and uh, you know, a lot of people have problems with students having their laptops open in front of them or, or their hands held open and so on. So I, I think we have to kind of question what it is that students do and are they actually doing things which are appropriate or inappropriate. But even if they are, aren't doing things that are appropriate, I think it's up to us to kind of scaffold and, and, and to create environments where they want to do things that are appropriate with their tools. And um, so, so I think the onus is on us as much on, on them. But uh, we'll move on. And, and I want to talk about um, learning by doing, which is, um, I suppose, Piaget and Dewey and various other uh, constructivists of the, um, the last century talked about this. And um, the, the, the kind of the idea about actively engaging yourself in learning by doing so that you can understand the concepts behind something. and. Um, Here's uh, another statement by Seymour Papert, um, who, who kind of um, advocated learning by making, uh, the, the constructionist theory as, it, as it's now known. Here are some of my students who you'll see later on in the video, and they're actually creating a video of their own here. I didn't ask them to do that, I just said, go away and study this and then come back and report to me. 
So some of them decided to do an animation video, and that's exactly what they did. And you see them there working on it on the floor. Uh, with some very basic tools, essentially. One of them borrowed a, a tripod, and they used, um, I think it was um, a camera on his um, on his uh, iPhone to actually uh, record, and uh, they could stop go motion, and they went away and edited it on um, Microsoft, um, and, and then brought it back and, and showed it, and I thought they did amazingly. Um, so students would do these things proactively without you really asking them, because they know that they can. Um, and this video here, I hope um, we're all going to be able to see this one. This, I think, Steve, is the first one on the list of three that I sent you. This is my students talking about what they've brought to the university that has changed their own learning. So let's just watch this one. I think it's only a very short video, about a minute and a half. And I'm doing the same thing. I'm putting it in the chat if anybody has trouble seeing it in the web Thank door. Thank you. So there you have a kind of um, a set of student responses about um, what they're bringing into the class. And if I could just summarize what they said here. Um, one of them was saying that it provides them with a stronger voice. Um, it allows them to question and have dialogue with their, 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 um, their teachers, their lecturers, me included. It allows them to have conversations outside as well. Um, yeah, I, I guess Kate's right. It does um, ask about multitasking. I find that my, my students, the ones in this group anyway, tend to multitask quite easily. Um, they tend to be doing lots of things all at once, and they, they switch rapidly between them. And I don't think they find a problem with that at all. But it allows them to revisit things later on as well, as one of them said. It allows them to go back and check and verify and maybe search and add more content which maybe wasn't covered in the lecture or the seminar. Um, so what it's doing is it's allowing them to extend and, and enrich their learning even more. If I can get my slides back, um, Steve, if that's possible. Thanks. And we'll move on and we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about, um, uh, talk a little, little bit more about what's coming next. Um, my, my browser is seized up here. Uh, here we are. Um, and, and we talk about learning by making, but it's really about user-generated content in this context. And there are lots of different ways that um, students can can create content and lots of different tools they can use. Here are just some of the things I see them doing almost every day now. Ultimately, that user-generated content is shared. It's used as a kind of um, a, a rallying point around which they um, discuss their content, both within the group and with myself and other colleagues, but also with um, students outside and, and, and uh, professors outside of the, um, of the four walls of our institution as well, because they can do so using things like Twitter. And uh, there are some very powerful conversations I see going on inside and outside the classroom. 
Um, the learning doesn't stop when they leave the classroom. In fact, that's when it really starts. And then um, Seymour Papert again says that the learner taking charge is probably the best way forward. I, I, I see that happening a lot now. I see the learner taking charge more of their own learning because they have the tools that allow them to do that. Um, and part of the, the deal here is that they create their own personal learning networks, and I think we do the same. So if you can imagine um, these people here as, as just a representation of, of the world's population, you know, kind of slim down to about 40 people. Um, you can imagine that guy on the left there who's standing next to that yellow table. If he connects with just three people, that's four in the network. But if each of those connects as well to other people, suddenly you've got an exponential, uh, an amazing kind of uh, set of connections. And, and people can start sharing content with each other. They can start con conversing with each other over things that, um, that concern them. In, in effect, they are forming communities of practice, communities of interest, which um, is essentially what Leib and Banger were talking about when I mentioned them earlier on. So we've got a very powerful set of tools here which allow us to connect with each other very, very quickly. And um, you may not know all these people, but you know what they're thinking because they share it with you. And, and you know um, a little bit about their background because they share that as well sometimes. So you feel that you know them even when you don't. So the weak social ties actually tend to, to sometimes work better than the stronger social ties of people that you actually know for real. Um, and I suppose students in some ways are now choosing what they want to learn and how they want to learn it. And I, I, I'm, I'm one of these people that gives students an option uh, in my lessons to actually um, to decide what their essay title is going to be, for instance. And then they'll go off, once we've agreed on, uh, on, on what that topic is going to be, they'll go off and they will uh, research that and become experts in the room on that topic. And when they come back and talk to all the other students, the other students tend to, um, to learn from each other. Um, so another kind of concept here is that um, learning is now distributed outside of, of the, the head. It's in the head, but it's also outside the head in other people's heads. So in effect, you don't have to learn everything anymore. You just have to know where to find it when, it's, um, when you need it. And that's, I suppose, the theory of connectivism, which Downs and Seaman talk, Seaman's talk about. Um, it, it's also about teaching each other, the paragogy, um, which is um, Cornelli and Danoff's theory. It's also about hodagogy, you know, the idea of self-determined learning, which is Hayes and Kenyon. And all of these um, theories are now coming in, these new theories, um, uh, 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 to explain what's happening out there, what we see happening, the shifts, the changes. The learning revolution, as, as, as this series is called. Um, and these changes are happening quite rapidly, and they're taking lots of lecturers and teachers by surprise. Educators, some of them don't know how to cope with this. But it's happening nonetheless, and I think we need to get over it and start to see the potential of it. Um, and I'm not sure I'm going to show this one, um, Steve. I'm going to move on because I'm going to be running out of time in a minute. But you can actually watch the videos if we share the, the links later on. Um, and watch them for yourself, and you can see what the students are saying about that question. But this idea of membership of the tribe, that the students are creating their own little tribes and little clans out there to um, discuss things. So they'll set up a Facebook page without me asking them. I, I, you know, I have nothing to do with their, with their um, Facebook pages. If they want to invite me in, I'll come and join, and I'll lurk in the corner, and I'll, I'll, I'll be quiet until they ask me a question. But generally speaking, they will set up their own Facebook pages and they will use them to support each other, to encourage each other, to share links and content. They'll do this rather than using the institutional learning management systems very often because they find Facebook a lot easier to use. They find it more attractive to use. They find it is less um, of a problem to navigate. So they'll go to Facebook when they want to and they'll go to the inst institutional learning management system when they have to. Uh, and so um, I don't tend to use the LMS either. I tend to um, set up transient um, spaces for them, like wikis and, and uh, shared blogs and so on, so that they can, um, they can find their way around a lot easier. Um, and this is the way I think that education is going in higher education. At least it's becoming much more informal, much more um, loosely aggregated than it, than it was in the past. And students are quite comfortable with that. And the first mobile phone was quite big, but we've all got them now. Yeah, I know it's a joke, but um, you can imagine the first mobile phones were all battery, really. Um, but because students have mobile phones in their pockets, this is what they tend to do.
they know that they can do stuff, they can create videos, they can take notes by just clicking onto things. Um, they can they can do a whole range of things with this little computer that's in their pocket now. And it's becoming their badge, I suppose, of identity. It's becoming part of their professional and personal identity. And um, you know, I think we just have to acknowledge now that they are continuing to use these tools, and, and, and they will become more and more adept at using them. And they become these tools will become more powerful as time goes by. Um, Another thing that I'm seeing happening is that they're, they're setting up their own personal learning environments by selecting their own tools. You heard one of the students talking about using Evernote, another one was talking about using Twitter, and uh, a third one was talking about Google. Um, this is my pr uh, personal learning environment, I suppose, essentially, although I don't use any portfolio. I do use all these other tools, and I use them to actually learn from as well as to teach with. And I think the lines are actually blurring between the two now very um, considerably for me. Um, the personal learning network itself, and here's a kind of a better picture, I think, of the whole picture, if you like. The personal web tools are only a small part of my personal learning environment. There are a lot of other areas as well which we can talk about. And um, I think these slides, I'm going to make them available, or Steve's going to make them available afterwards, and there'll be a recording of this to actually give you more time to look at it. I'm just going to gloss over that and move on. I just want to say that PLEs uh, are all unique and individual. No, no two are the same. Um, but to learn uh, as, as kind of, um, to learn personally in, in a social environment, a rich social environment, is possible. This is the example I often give. We are family. You, you see this family in the 1950s in America somewhere, and they're watching a black and white television. And there's probably only one or two channels, maybe three channels to choose from. So they all gain the same experience. One television set in the room one television in the house, and they're all watching the same thing, and they're all experiencing it synchronously together as a family. If you now take a similar family and you move them on to 2014, it becomes we are family. And essentially, it's the same type of family gathered around a similar type of television, but now they've all got a device in their hand. They've all got an individual tool which allows them to tailor their own experience within that rich group social context. And I'm putting it to you now that that's exactly what's making the difference in education today, is that students all have a personal device in their hand now with which they can respond to content, which they can search, they can create content, they can repurpose it. There's, uh, yeah, it is still um, synchronous. Um, and there is an asynchronous version, Kate, as you well know, as we all well know, there are asynchronous aspects of this where you can take pictures, of, uh, as I showed earlier on, and you can go away and reflect on it and then maybe write a blog about it or, or talk to each other outside. So there are asynchronous versions uh, and, and possibilities that are available. And the two tend to blur together. The real blended learning approach is not, you know, are you in the classroom or are you not anymore? That doesn't matter anymore. What really matters is, is blending synchronous and asynchronous, personal versus social, um, you know, live versus um, reflective and so on. That's the true blended learning though. So, um, good question. Um, I just want to mention Csikszentmihalyi Mahali um, and his flow theory, which I, I, I talked about today in another session uh, up at Warwick University when, I, when um, we'll be discussing something. And you notice that students who are playing games, and maybe yourself too, who, who are, if you're playing games or if you're doing something which is really absorbing, um, you get into this flow and you forget about time, you forget to eat, you even forget to you know, do other things like go to the toilet perhaps. Uh, and, and the thing is, it's all about um, what Csikszentmihalyi talks about, about balancing um, anxiety against boredom. If you start off at P1, position one, and you go outside it to P2, what, what's happening there? In effect, is you're becoming anxious because the challenge is increasing, but your skills aren't. On the other side, if you go to P3, what's happening there? You become bored because your skills increase, but the challenge doesn't. So our job as, as educators, I think, is to uh, um, produce environments and also to produce challenges and, and problems and other kind of um, learning situations for our students where they get to P4, where their anxiety and boredom is balance because the challenge and the skills are constantly going up together. Um, I'm going to move on to talk about this very briefly. This is probably familiar to you all, the idea of zone of proximal development. 
And I'm saying now that I think, and lots of us are saying now, that technologies and tools actually can sometimes replace or, or, or enrich or extend and supplement the knowledge of another person. You put the two together, those two theories together, and you can see that it's probably possible to reduce anxiety and boredom even further if you use tools and people together. Yeah, Vygotsky strikes again. Um, this wasn't me that said this originally. This was David Jonathan, who was a distinguished professor at, Col um, I think it was Colorado University, and before that he was at Penn State. I had the honor of meeting him. He's sadly no longer with us, but he said that computers are mind tools. They extend our abilities in many ways, and they also engage learners in critical thinking. So it's really important, I think, that we um, we acknowledge that new learners can do all this. This is what new learners are all about today. And when I say new learners, I mean across the whole board. People coming in with these tools into your classroom, whether they are 45 or, or 15 or, or whatever age they are, um, they are becoming the nodes of their own production. They want to collaborate. They want feedback from their peers as well as from you. And they are much more self-directed, according to John Waters, anyway. Um, so. Just a few more pictures. I, I like this one because it <laughs> it talks about digital identity, I suppose. It talks about um, a number of other things as well. It talks about you know the provenance and, and, and uh, truthfulness of, of content. Um, but you know, I show my students this. I uh, say, so what's wrong with it? And they go, ooh, is it 70%? You know, and after a while, they get what I've done. They realise that. Um, that they shouldn't believe everything they see on the internet. In other words, they need these new digital literacies. They need, dis they need digital wisdom. Um, Howard Reingold, who I think has spoken at this event, that was it yesterday, uh, he has a very good expression. He says, we, we all need a BS detector. Uh, I don't think that stands for Bachelor of Science. Um, so really, I think all, all learners have got to understand that um, not everything on the internet is, is perfect or, or, um, or true. They've got to be critical of everything. Um, here's some of the other literacies that I, I, I've identified, and other people are identifying others as well. These are not exhaustive, but these are just some of the, the possibilities, some of the things that I think all learners need now, and we as educators also need. Um, and a final statement before I finish. John Gardner, he said this, all too often we are giving young people cut flowers when we should be teaching them to grow their own plants. So I think that sums up exactly what I've been saying today. Students will drive change themselves, but they need to be given the opportunity to do so. And with that, I'll give you my contact details and say thank you very much. And there's my three students' names there for you. You'll find all of them on Twitter as well if you want to follow them. But they're doing some incredibly good stuff. So thank you very much for listening. I hope that's been useful. And I will um, you know, uh, open up for questions now if you want me to. Um, Thank you. So if you have a question for Steve, you can uh, click on the hand icon. That's the third icon over in the participant window. We'll give you the microphone. Or you can put it in the chat. You can also clap for Steve by hovering over the smiley face and looking for the applause button. <laughs> Steve, do you want me to put those other video links in the chat? Uh, yes, if you could. Thanks, Steve. That would be great. I'll put my video back on as well, so um, you can see my ugly face. So there's the, there's the link. Thanks, Steve. Those are the three links to the student policies. You saw the first one, but you may have an opportunity if you want to explore the other two. They're quite short, but I think they're quite um, important things that my students are saying. Steve, I'm really interested in the degree to which a lot of what we talk about when we talk about students sort of driving their own learning presumes that the, the freedom and empowerment narrative of education is the reality. But I also wonder if a lot of times we are living in a state of cognitive dissonance where we use the language of freedom and self-direction, but the system itself is actually largely about control. Yeah, that's a really that's a really important point you're making. That it, it is. I think it was William Gibson that once said, "The future is with us, but it's just not evenly distributed." And I think we can say the same thing about freedom and education. It, it's with us in places, but it's not evenly distributed. So, in effect, things like um, the the education system as it stands in some places, and things like 
um, assessment regimes, you know, final exams, you know, are they anachronist now? You know, anachronistic now? Are they are they kind of past their sell by date? And I think they are. I think a lot of the assessment methods that we use to assess our students now are passe. They they, they are beyond um, their use usefulness. Um, and and uh, I think we have to question, significantly question, the way that our education systems are built now. I know people like Sir Ken Robinson and Sigata Nietzsche and various other critical commentators around the world are actually questioning the, the very nature of, of education. And, and um, yes, yeah, standardized testing, for instance. What is standardized testing all about? You know, does one size fit all? Well, no, patently it doesn't. Um, standardized testing is good for one thing only in schools. It's good to show the government who is funding those schools exactly where, student, uh, where, where, where schools sit within a league table. It's nothing to do with students learning. It's nothing to do with, with how, how learners perform. It's to do with how schools perform. And I think the same thing applies to universities. We look at league tables there as well based on the exam results. And I think um, that has to be significantly challenged. If we're going to be using assessment for learning rather than of learning, which is the right way forward, then we've got to devise new ways of feeding back and feeding forward to students to show them what they should be doing as well as what they, what they have done. And this is why in um, a lot of my courses now, what I do is I, I provide students with many, many different formats which they can submit their work in. I never, ever run exams anymore. I've done away with that. We've all done away with that in my department. And, and uh, what we do now is we, we do continuous assessment instead of an assessment that is based on what students are interested in achieving. So I guess, and Kate, do, yeah, do your okay. students create digital portfolios? Uh, yes, some of them do, but they do that um, off their own back. They do that because they want to, not because I ask them to. And I think they see the value of it when we cover it in one of our lessons. So I can't stay. I was just going to say, if you have another question, please feel free to put it in the chat or to raise your virtual hand. I guess in the United States, we have a little bit of a history of using the language of democracy. But when things get too democratic, the institutional forces kind of come back down. Uh, the, we saw this after the 1890s with the muckraking journalism. And we saw it after the 1960s. So you know, I wonder if the, the, the language of democracy and self-direction um, sort of trick us into thinking that's actually at the core of most education systems. And, and will we face sort of larger challenges when we realize we don't really know how to do self-direction for everybody? Yeah, I, I, that's, um, that's a big problem. It's an inherent problem. I think it comes from the system that we've imposed upon our students. And in, in fact, was imposed upon us when we were at university and school and so on. I think we tend to teach the way we were taught ourselves. And it's breaking out of that mold. Um, I think um, I, I preach heresy often. I, I preach um, positive deviance. In other words, um, you know, doing things slightly differently and then getting away with it. You know, asking for, you know, for forgiveness rather than permission. So um, going back to um, Kate's question about do you have rubrics for assessment? Yes, we do. I stick rigidly to those because that's what the degree um, degree programs that we're teaching are, are based upon. But within that, there's a lot of latitude for interpretation to give students freedom. So for instance, two years ago, I suggested to my students that instead of just thinking about submitting to me a paper-based assignment, that they think of other alternatives with an equivalency. And so one of them came to me and said, can I do a video? And I said, yes. Now, we, we negotiated a 5,000 word equivalent. And they went away and they did the video, submitted it. Two others uh, submitted blogs um, on a 5,000 word equivalency, which was much easier to do. When it came to me um, marking the assignments, it was easy because I used the old rubrics, the old assessment criteria that we apply. And that was within the rules. Um, but the rules didn't say that you couldn't submit a video or a blog, and I'd, I'd scrutinized this, and I'd, I'd made the decision that that was all I was going to do to break the mold. The professional services, the admin people at the time, they went crazy. They said, Steve, you can't do this. You know, you, you've got us in a really bad position there. I said, why? They said, well, we need printouts of everything. And I said, well, how are you going to print out a video? How are you going to print out hyperlinks? How are you going to show where the blogs link to each other? 
And they couldn't answer me. And they said, and so they came up with another problem. They said, well, the external examiner is going to go crazy over this, the guy who, who we bring in to actually look at all the final work. And I, so I said, okay, I'll give you the phone. I phoned him up. And I said, are you okay with this? And he said, yeah, I'm fine with that. And so they ran out of ideas uh, and problems in the end to, to actually um, counter what I was doing. And so basically that, that's broken the mold now. And there are a, a lot of courses that are running in, in our department now do the same thing. Um, alternatives that students can create posters now if they want to, or they can do podcasts. Um, basically what we're doing is giving them the opportunity to, to, to try out all sorts of different approaches to expressing themselves uh, and to practice what we call transliteracy, the ability to be able to present yourselves equally powerfully across lots of different platforms. And I think that is one of the ways forward for, for, for freedom in education in the future space. Do we have any sense of how this is actually playing out once they finish school and are seeking employment or starting their own ventures? Um, I can give you an example of one of my students who um, he crashed out in his second year. He was, he was training to be a teacher. And he crashed out in his second year because he'd been a bad boy, basically. He, he wasn't um, uh, well liked amongst the staff because he was disruptive. He used to come in late and go early and didn't put his assignments in on time. And he was totally disengaged. And in, in the end, they threw him off the course. He, he was gone for a year. And then he came back the following year and said to me, Steve, can I join the third year of your education studies course? And this is a course which doesn't. Um, give you a teaching qualification at the end, but it gives you a degree in education, which you can then go off and do additional qualifications to train as a teacher with in, in the UK. And um, he, I, I accepted him back on the course. I said, you know, you've got to really behave yourself now. So he did. He came back. He knuckled down and he got down to the job. And I, I watched him closely, and I saw he was doing good work. And eventually, he achieved. In his final assignment for me, he achieved uh, what we call a first. It was over 70%. In other words, he was the top um, grade that he could possibly get. It was an a, even A student, an A plus student, basically. And, uh, and I said to him at the time, I said, um, do you know that's publishable with a bit of tweaking, with a bit of um, additional work on it? You could publish that. And you know, it was a throwaway remark, but he took it seriously. He said to me, well, can you help me? And so I, I coached him, and I showed him how he could write it for, for publication. He submitted it to a peer-reviewed online article, uh, online journal, and after a few changes, it was published. And he was published before he before he actually qualified. And I took him to a conference the following year with me. Um, once he once he was doing his, his teacher training, and I showed him the, um, the conference proceedings. And, and lo and behold, one of the professors who was presenting had cited his article in the paper he was supposed to present, and. This was incredible for my student. He couldn't believe that he was being cited by a well-known professor. It really um, kind of bolstered his, his confidence. He went off. He got himself a really great job uh, as a teacher the following year. And in two years, he became head of department. And that's just one story about a, a failure that became a success through these kind of tools. Steve, thank you so much. Thank you. I'm clapping for you again. I think we'll go ahead and close. That gives people a chance to take a quick break. We do have three sessions coming up, and they're in the calendar schedule. They're all, they all look really good. Uh, Steve, have a good night. Appreciate your being here. Really terrific to hear from you. Good night, everyone. Thank you very much. See you on Twitter.